This episode is brought to you by the American Homebrewers Association, host of Virtual Big Brew, a worldwide celebration of homebrewing that's happening on Saturday, May 2nd. Be counted in this year's record-breaking Virtual Big Brew event. Pledge to homebrew this May 2nd at homebrewersassociation.org. That's homebrewersassociation.org. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, April 23rd, 2020. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, I talk with Phil Nagash, formerly of the My Life as a Foodie podcast and now of CyclingOC.com. We talk about how we've been adapting our cooking in times of isolation and how to work some of that beer that you've been brewing into your meals. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. And if you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs, our brewer's logbooks, and other Basic Brewing gear. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic Brewing and find our show page on Facebook as well. We have a cool Basic Brewing app on iTunes and Amazon.com, and we're found all over the place where fine podcasts are served up. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. And thanks to everybody who's helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basic brewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. And again, many thanks to everybody who's hanging with us during these more than challenging times. I hope that you and yours are doing well. Hang in there. Financial supporters on Monday got an early release of the next basic brewing video episode, along with a bonus video for uh, premium subscribers, I guess you'd say, and a recipe. Uh, this time, it's my 15-minute Kviking Pale Ale. It's a smash beer with uh, Breeze Pale Ale malt and Cascade hops, only boiled for 15 minutes with a 10-minute hop stand after the boil. Also dry hopped in the uh, fermenter with Cascade. I use the uh, Kviking, uh, Kvike blend, and I'm really happy with the beer. Uh, the general public will see that episode next week. It's the first episode that Steve Wilkes of stevesbrewshop.com and I have shot while observing social distancing. Uh, I was in the kitchen as usual, and Steve was uh, on Skype uh, in uh, in his office there at the brew shop. We were still able to have some fun, and I hope that you like it. Uh, the episode uh, coming up next will be about my brown ale, which I used uh, in a crock pot uh, to cook a chuck roast. Uh, which uh, Phil and I will talk about that uh, coming up in the show. Let's take a quick look into the mailbag. Jacob from Chilliwack, British Columbia in Canada writes, I brewed a Pilsner with a starting gravity of 1050, fermented with saff lager, W3470 dry lager yeast, rehydrated in a simple water sugar solution, fermented 4 to 8 degrees Celsius, Canadian garage temps, <laughs> for three days with no activity. Brought into the house for a day at 16C, and the fermentation went crazy. Put it back in the garage to finish fermentation. Spent nine days fermenting at 10 degrees Celsius. That's a 50 uh, Fahrenheit, by the way. I know that one. Uh, and then it stopped, Jacob says. Gravity at that point seemed appropriate, maybe a little sweet at 1020. So popped the carboy in the fridge to lager. Fast forward 14 days, and Jacob checked on the beer, and it's fermenting again. The airlock is bubbling away at a frosty 1.6 degrees Celsius. Gravity reading is currently 1017. Jacob says, curious for your input, is this normal operation for a lager? My first time making a lager not from a Cooper's kit. Or have I discovered some ancient Ice Age yeast strain? <laughs> well, here's what I wrote back to Jacob. I said, I first... I wonder if uh, moving the fermenter in the fridge physically roused up the yeast and got it going again. Um, I said, if I were you, I'd move the beer to rim temperature and maybe rouse the yeast up again to make sure that it finishes the job of fermenting that beer uh, before putting it back in the refrigerator for long-term lagering. And uh, as a bonus, uh, that'll give the yeast an opportunity to clean up any uh, buttery or butterscotchy diacetyl flavors uh, at the same time. But that's just my two cents. It, it seems like it's not done yet. I wonder if you can hear that thunder. we got some thunderstorms coming in. I think it's better to be safe uh, than to be sorry on both the completed fermentation and the diacetyl off flavor fronts. 
uh, or maybe since uh, Jacob's in uh, British Columbia, maybe it's better to be safe than sorry. <laughs> let us know how it turns out, Jacob. Uh, before the storms come in, let's talk about our friends and sponsors, Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa. What do you do when you're stuck in the house doing some healthy self-isolation these days? Well, a lot of you are brewing. Some are dusting off brewing gear that you haven't used in a while, and others are just ramping up production because you've got time on your hands. Well, you can use those hands to navigate over to HighGravityBrew.com and check out the Build Your Own Beer page. On that page, you can see in dramatic fashion how well-stocked the High Gravity store is. Whether you brew extract or all grain, want your grain crushed or have your own mill yourself, the uh, Build Your Own Beer page on HighGravityBrew.com has got you covered. For example, on that page, I count 18 base malts, 16 crystal malts, 29 specialty malts, and 9 unmalted adjunct grains. And I'm, I'm not even going to count all the hops. You get the idea. There, <laughs> then there's the flavorings, the other adjuncts, the yeast from several manufacturers, both dry and liquid. It's all on one page, and it totals your order at the bottom of the window as you choose your stuff, and that's always visible. Pretty darn cool. And, of course, if you're ready and able to take the pain out of propane by going electric, HighGravityBrew.com has their own Warthog controllers and systems, along with other manufacturers as well. From five gallons to two barrels, HighGravityBrew.com has what you need. And if you use the code EBC75BB, you can save 75 bucks off your electric gear purchase. That's at family-owned and operated HighGravityBrew.com. Okay, Phil and I had a lot of fun talking. Uh, now, he'll be the first to admit that he's quite a character. He <laughs> he grew up just down the road here, or at least part of his growing up was here in northwest Arkansas, but he's now, woo, he's now living in California. Oh, ah, that's a big one. As we, t <laughs> as we talk about in the interview, Phil has put together a free downloadable cookbook just for this occasion, and we talk about how you get that uh, during the interview. It's really cool. Phil Nagash, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. How are you? I'm well, uh, and I'm hoping that you and yours are well as well. Doing okay. Wish I could find toilet paper. <laughs> Well, you know, we had, a trick, we had a trick when we were in, in grade school that if you take a piece of notebook paper and crumple it up and then open it back yeah. up and smooth it out and crumple it up and smooth it back out again, you do that enough and it gets really soft. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. They say times are tough. The New York Times is really tough. <laughs> Especially because it's, it's like on your iPad. <laughs> yeah, it's like sandpaper. Yeah, really. <laughs> Now, I, I think I looked – what was it? I looked online in the archives, and you and I talked about kombucha the last time we talked about it on this show. And I yeah. thought, I thought, man, it's been, it's been like a year since I've talked. To, it's been three years since we talked. Three years. Wow. Well, a lot has changed. Yeah. And, and uh, life is just zooming by way too fast. Yeah. Uh, now, I, I called upon you because your food expertise, because I, I got to know you through your podcast my Li and your website, My Life as a Foodie. But you've gone from foodie to fitness nowadays. Yeah, I actually tried um, to incorporate my new fitness lifestyle into my show uh, a few times back in the day, and it just never really caught on. My audience just wasn't into it. And uh, my numbers would drop every time I do a show that talked about eating healthy or uh, trying to stay active. And uh, I just finally I gave up and I wasn't going to try anymore. And uh, I understood and I respected my audience for it. But I just decided to move on from the show and uh, live my life and have a lifestyle that uh, I really want to have now. It's not that I don't enjoy food and I enjoy cooking. I, I enjoy it more now than I ever have. It's just that uh, my life is a lot different. And I want to be an active, you know, endurance athlete and eat a certain way. And that's what I'm doing now. And you're, you're focusing uh, mostly on, on YouTube videos of, of biking. And you, you strap a, a, a GoPro on your head or your chest and you, and you go on these beautiful rides down these long uh, public uh, – up here in northwest Arkansas, what we have is – we call it a greenway. But these, these uh, paths – and so you have this kind of running narration uh, 
about, uh, you know, your life and what's going on and recipe ideas even and such as that. But what people uh, – what captured me was the scenery. And, you yeah. know, if you are stuck inside on a treadmill – or on an exercise bike or something like that and want to watch something, find, you know, find something just to watch to make it feel like you're in the great outdoors, your videos are great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I started this series called Spokes uh, about two or three years ago. And I don't have very many. I think I'm up to like 28 episodes now, but I'm really starting to gain some traction. So I'm doing them more often and I'm trying to go to new places. I'm trying to actually go on some more off course, uh, some dirt rides because there's a lot of dirt trails I've yet to explore on the show. So I'm trying to incorporate that now. But yeah, I try to keep them short because you know people will lose interest over time. Um, there are a lot of videos like that on YouTube, and some are up to an hour long. Um, I just don't have a lot to talk about in an hour. And sometimes it's a little difficult. I'm on that bike, and you know it gets a little tough to talk and ride. So I, I take my time when I want to say something. I slow down. I record um, you know, what I need to say. And then I uh, just keep writing, but I appreciate you checking them out. Yeah. And the, and the quality is good. It's not like, you know, you hear the wind blowing all the time in the microphone, even on windy days. I don't know what your microphone setup is, but, uh, you know, there's, there's not a lot of distracting noise. It's professionally done. So, so check out, search for Phil Nagash and spokes, uh, on the YouTubes and, uh, and go for a ride with Phil. Yeah. I have a website called cyclingoc.com. You can check it all out right there. There you go. Yeah. Well, uh, we're here to talk about food. And it really, you know, we've been trying to isolate as much as possible and trying not to go to the grocery store as much as possible. And, in fact, I told you the other day when I enlisted your help in this that whenever I go to the grocery store now, I kind of see it as a defeat because it's like, oh, no, you know, my plan, I ran out of food or I ran out of this one ingredient for this dish. Uh, so I've been trying to uh, and I've actually been enjoying it, trying to strategize and plan before I go to the grocery store, because I used to go like every other day. Now my my goal is to go like every other week. Um, so I wanted to talk to somebody who knows food and knows cooking and knows beer as well to kind of have a conversation about how we can, through this self-isolation and, you know, this uh, this learning to be more self-sufficient on the cooking side, on the food side, how we can kind of get some ideas on how to keep that fresh and, keep uh, you know, keep the ideas fresh and keep the food fresh, too. Yeah, just, you know, I'll tell you, the one thing about this that has really kind of hit me is, and I know you're like this, too, James, is that I like going to the market a lot. Like if I don't go every day, it's every other day. I like to buy things as fresh as I can. And also I go in, sometimes I don't have a plan. I just I know I want to make something and I let the ingredients that are available tell me what I'm going to make because it's just how I like to cook. I, I don't have that luxury now. And it's half the time you can't find the things you're looking for because, you know, they're gone. People have hoarded a lot of ingredients. So it's forced us to think ahead and it's forced us to utilize things we wouldn't ordinarily buy. Things like dried goods that you have to rehydrate and cook or even things that are in cans. So um, I'm hoping that today we can clear some of that up, give you some ideas, and uh, hopefully get you on the road to eating well uh, without having to put a whole lot of uh, effort into it. Here, here's a picture of me in the uh, in the, in the uh, the grocery store nowadays because I I go through my little list of recipes that I most frequently make and I. Mm -hmm make my list of ingredients, and I put it on little post-it notes, and they're coordinated to which side of the store, that you know, which section of the store their the ingredients are on. And so I come in with my homemade mask with, uh, you know, that made from a T-shirt and a coffee filter and a couple of rubber bands, and it doesn't fit very well. So, you know, I'm like huffing and puffing, trying to go as fast, and my glasses are fogging up. And it's like, you know, the, I don't know if you ever saw the game show Supermarket Sweeps, but it's the <laughs> from like the yeah. 90s. But that's yeah. me. I'm like going through the thing and trying to get all the ingredients as quick as possible and trying to get out there, you know, get out of there as quickly as possible. Uh, so, you know, being making a list ahead of time and and being, you know, organized and and like I say, not forgetting ingredients and, you know, stocking, not hoarding, but, you know, stocking on the stocking up on the stuff that you use the most, uh, you know, so that you just you just can keep out of that store. 
Um, you're far more obsessive about that than me. I go in. <laughs> I, I'm happy to be out of the house. So I'm t- I take my time. I wear, I'll wear two masks if I have to, but I'm in there to shop and I'll spend as much time in there as I can. But I totally understand where you're going with this. Yeah, we're uh, the. There may be more mask wearers uh, where you are in, you know, in the Los Angeles area than there are in Northwest Arkansas. I'm not sure, but uh... <laughs> let me tell you. Let me tell you something. I'm going to share a quick story for everybody here. Uh, where I live, we have a very high volume of Chinese immigrants that live in the area. They knew back in January mm. because I walked into a market one day and I saw that the entire section of rice and beans were gone. Before anything else disappeared, rice and beans were gone. And I thought, "Uh uh-oh, they know something we don't. For anybody who doesn't know, rice and beans, that's a complete protein. So you could literally live off of rice and beans if you had to. They knew something was going to happen. And uh, that was kind of my first foray into we might be looking at something serious here. And that's when I started to think about, you know, stocking up on a little few things like flour, things that might run out. And, uh, well, I was right about that. The one thing I wish I'd bought was toilet paper. Mm, Yeah. Well, the the uh, here in Northwest Arkansas, the uh, kinds of things when we went on our first big shopping trip, the things that were gone were stuff like butter, eggs, mm. sugar, and bread. So there's a lot of French toast being made out there. I'm thinking, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. People know how to eat. <laughs> but uh, but let's talk about first of all, what are the what are the things that that we should sort of avoid buying a whole lot of what are the what's the most fragile stuff and the stuff that if we want if we buy it we want to cook it as as quickly as possible or to use it as quickly as possible what's your priority list look like well obvious obviously things like fruits and vegetables those are things that you know you're going to want to eat as soon as you buy them so when you go into the market you know what you're going to make you have a, a plan uh and you buy those items, make sure that's probably one of the first, you know, it, within the first few days, things start to wilt. Even if you put them in a crisper drawer, they don't retain their freshness. So those are the things you're going to want to use as quickly as possible. Dairy uh, is one of those things that it, it does last a lot longer than you might think. Um, one of the things about milk is that, you know, you, it's got an expiration date on the top. That is really kind of the last day that thing's going to be good for you. But it's going to spoil that day. And the reason why is that the minute you open any container of cream, milk, or whatever, bacteria starts eating lactose. And this process starts. And that will spoil sooner than that date on that. I don't care if it says it's got a month left. Smell it. It's going to start going bad on you. Um, eggs is another thing. Eggs eggs will last a lot longer than you think. Eggs, um, there's a three-digit code on eggs. And it basically gives you an idea of how long those, you know, those eggs are going to last. Um, the way it's numbered, I believe it's 001. If you look on the carton, 001 from January 1st to 365 for obviously December 31st, that represents the date that the eggs were packed, which can be 30 days after the egg was laid. Now you've got an additional 30 days beyond that. So that's 60 full days. As long as you keep eggs in the refrigerator, they could last God knows how long. They can mm-hmm. last you up to two months. So those are things you don't have to worry about too much. And there's a um, trick if you're using eggs in a recipe, crack the eggs into a separate bowl first and check them out before you just dump the egg right like right into a big bunch of flour. Because if you have a rotten egg and you dump it into a big bunch of flour directly, you're stuck. But if you dump it into a little bowl first and you check it out and make sure it's okay, then you can dump that from the bowl into the into the recipe. Right. True. Um, condiments last forever, so you don't have to worry about condiments. Mustard, ketchup, things like that. Uh, it, really, anything in a can is going to last a very long time Mm -hmm. and the expiration also getting back to expiration dates expiration dates that are written on cans that's not the spoil date that's the date when that food no longer retains its flavor and freshness whatever that is it's canned but i mean it it, um it won't be it won't give you you know like botulism poisoning or anything like that unless the can of course is bulged or starts to you know rust things like that but then you're going to want to just toss that thing out but canned goods will last an awful long time um, as far as things like flour and oats, 
months. They'll, they'll last a long time. Cooked oats or pre-cooked oats, like the instant oats or instant grits, last a, like twice as long as regular flour or, or regular oats. So things to remember is uh, anything you're buying in those middle aisles of the grocery store generally are going to last quite a long time. You're good for a few months. Um, anything you buy in the outside perimeter aisle, unless you're able to freeze it, uh, you can freeze milk. Uh, of course, meat you can freeze, mm-hmm. uh, anything like that. You're going to lose something from anything you put in the freezer. But for the most part, it's not going to be uh, it's negligible, those losses. Yeah, you can you can do uh, what we've done is is make like uh, if you've got a dish with perishable things, uh, you make like maybe twice as much. And then you right. freeze, you know, half of that. And then you've got that as, as you know, a store. These are like grandma things. You know, this is what yeah. <laughs> grandma right. used to do. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, if you've got some broccoli, say, or some squash or something like that, you know, cook a bunch of it ahead of time, you know, chill it down. And then I've got a vacuum sealer thingy uh, that we bought several years ago. I bought, oh, yeah. actually bought it when I, when I grew hops. <laughs> oh, nice. So this is, is actually, you know, what started out as a beer thing, but now it's, you know, just a regular food thing. But, yeah. you know, we, we, I go to the uh, club store and I stock up on, <clears throat> on uh, like uh, the cubed stew meat, uh, the beef. Right. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I take, I buy like a big five pound package of that and I separate it into like three portions and vacuum seal that and put it in the freezer. You know, same thing with like ribs or, you know, I can cook a bunch of ribs ahead of time and then freeze that, you know, and, uh, you know, so you can, you can have this, this freezer full of stuff that you can, you know, rely on as, you know, just as, as well as you can rely on the, uh, the canned stuff or the, or the dried stuff. I like making stews and soups and I make a lot of it and I end up freezing it a lot of the time because it's just great. It it freezes well when it defrosts. It really hasn't lost a whole lot in in most cases, just uh, a tiny bit of texture, but it's not really anything that anybody notices. And you've got ready made meals in a freezer. All you have to do is defrost and eat. So yeah, you're on the right track. And I think that that's something people need to start thinking about seriously as if you're going to make some food, make a lot of it, freeze some of it, uh, that way, if push comes to shove, there's nothing to eat. You've got something in the freezer. All you have to do is defrost it, reheat it, and you're you're eating a meal. And I've and I've discovered a couple of uh, uh, meals that uh, are easy to put together with stable ingredients like fried rice, uh, using you know obviously dried rice. Uh, spam. I found some teriyaki spam at the grocery. All the regular spam was gone, but they had teriyaki yeah. spam. They had jalapeno spam. The spam light uh, obviously was still there because no, you know, <laughs> why would you get right. spam light? Uh, you know, I I tell you something. Go ahead, keep going. But I've got something to say after you're done. But the, but but using uh, some assorted, uh, you know, one of those big bags of frozen assorted vegetables. Uh, in with you know fried rice uh, with spam and a, maybe an egg or two, um, you know super easy to to make and it's all stable ingredients because it's either dried yeah. or it's canned or it's frozen. Spaghetti sauce is is the same way. Yeah, you know what that that teri- I saw your post that teriyaki spam. I don't know why anyone would make the fried rice without that. That sounded great. <laughs> you know teriyaki spam sounds great. It was actually pretty good. On the sh- I'm looking on the shelves of the grocery store when, you know, when the hoarders came and things started disappearing. The things that were left on the shelves, I'm thinking to myself, let this be a notice to anybody who is a buyer for a supermarket. <laughs> Never order that again because it was the last thing on the shelf. And for some reason, I don't know why, nobody wants like hazelnut butter bagel, you know? <laughs> Yeah, there are a lot of embarrassed brand managers out there. <laughs> oh my god! I mean, there's just some things that should not exist, yet they do, and obviously, no one's buying it. Yeah, there there are various flavors of the Dove soap that were not popular at all. All the all the shelves were empty except for Dove, and pack yeah. and poked under under the shelf. I had to bend down to find. I found a big package of uh, ivory soap, uh, you know, right. which is which is ninety nine and forty four one hundredths uh, pure, by the way. Uh, oh. <laughs> I want to know what's in that <laughs> that fifty six percent or fifty six one hundredths. Yeah. Is it is it ivory? Is it actual ivory that's in there? That's not right. Uh, we... 
but Dove is one quarter uh, moisturizing cream, I think. So, <laughs> would it be? It would be embarrassing for brewers if we suddenly had a beer shortage and the only beers left were literally the outcasts of the beer world. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to say. Suddenly, I'm not going to yeah. mention any any. Uh, yeah. You know, I I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, that peanut butter raspberry stout wasn't such a good idea after all, was it? <laughs> glitter beer. Nobody's making glitter beer anymore, yeah. right? So I can I can no. I can disc glitter beer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, we need to we need to start talking about beer. But one one thing on our list was to talk about dishes that you can cook ahead of time, and then use the leftovers from that to new uh, fresh dishes. Uh, and you had a suggestion or two about that. Yeah, actually, um, well, I've I've put together an assortment of recipes that we're going to share uh, in a little while here, uh, not on the show, but you know, overall. Um, dishes basically that are literally almost like one pot dishes, uh, which are my favorite things anyway. One pot dishes are great because you can cook it in advance. And when the family's ready to eat, just put the heat back on, it heats up and everyone's eating. It's great for leftovers. A lot of this stuff will freeze well, but a, a lot of the stuff is literally, they're, they're like classic dishes that still taste great. They're not that hard to make. Literally some, most of these you can make in under 30 minutes. And again, great, you know, if you want to freeze it and reheat it, it's still as good as it was the first time you made it. Uh, Vietnamese pho, which is a, a Vietnamese uh, chicken noodle soup. Um, get a recipe for that. One of my favorite recipes of all time, which everybody loves, is a gorgonzola ale soup mm. with potatoes, gorgonzola cheese, and some pale ale. Um, beer battered fish tacos are my all time favorite thing. Well, That's wait, not well, something ba- that ba- back that up the back well. up the truck here, Phil. You got to give us a little a little details on these recipes. We got to give us some give us some guidance. I mean, we don't want to go list by list on the, you know ingredient by ingredient on these, but you got to give us a little bit of uh, of insight on on you know how to put these things together. If it was if it, I, I have flashbacks to your old show where you talk about you know building a recipe and there were sound effects in the background with it. I don't want to go that far. All right. but... <laughs> okay, all right. Well, but, but paint a paint a you. picture here. Make us hungry. Here's some simple. This is this is just how easy this stuff is. The, I'm going to use the gorgonzola ale soup as a perfect example. You take a couple of Yukon gold potatoes and a few cups of chicken stock, and you, you get it over to a, a simmer, like a, a slow rolling boil. Cook those until the potatoes are nice and tender. Take it off the heat. Now, I'm generalizing here. There's a little more to this, but it's, this is basically the gist of it. You take it off the heat. You allow it to cool. You transfer that to a blender. You keep the top on that blender with a nice hot rag. Otherwise, you're going to get hot potato soup in your face. You puree it on high. You get it nice and smooth. You put it back in the pot. Get it back up to a simmer. You get the heat going. You crumble some gorgonzola cheese inside that. You stir it around. You get the cheese nice and melty. You add a little bit of beer. Boom. That's the soup. It's as easy as that. And what beer would you recommend for that one? I would recommend a very lightly hopped ale. Now, anything way under, like, let's say 50 IBUs would be the max I'd go. The thing to remember about anything you're cooking with beer is that this isn't like, you know, if you the, the common misnomer with cooking with wine is that I'm going to use something cheap. No, you don't want to. You want to use something good, something you'd want to drink, because if it tastes cheap, it's going to taste cheap in your dish. So use a beer you like, a light lager, uh, a pale ale that's lightly hopped. Uh, Pilsner, perfect in this dish. Uh, you're going to cook. You're going to get it up to a boil. So you're going to cook a lot of that alcohol out, but it's going to taste unctuous. It's going to have that a, a great malty flavor. Something with a strong malt base would be fantastic. A little bit of sweet. Uh, it brings a lot of character to the soup. The one thing you don't want to do is beer in it. Otherwise, it's going to look like, you know, muddy water, which is just not palatable. But uh, light beers, generally, I like to cook with Belgian ales. In most of my dishes, um, light, uh, pale ales, pilsners, um, really mostly beers that are straw colored, unless I'm cooking something deep, like a beef bourguignon, I'd use uh, a dark Mm. Belgian double or a Trappist ale, you know, something with a lot of character. Uh, But again, got to really be attention to the hops. If you use something with too much hops in anything you cook, it's going to taste acrid and it's really hard to get that taste out. 
So, um, yeah, that's yeah. A, that's something I really concentrate on. It seems to be like like dark beers. Like I've got this brown ale uh, on on tap, and I used it to uh, to cook a, a pot roast or a, a chuck roast the other day. Right, uh, that's good. Super simple recipe. You just put uh, your chuck roast along with some rosemary and some sage and some thyme uh, in uh, in the crock pot with uh, some taters and some chunked up uh, uh, carrots and some celery uh, and then some onion. And then I use yeah. three three cups of this brown ale and just let it go all day. And nice. uh, man, oh, man, was that good. Um, yeah, that's great. And I sent you a recipe. You put together a document uh, with uh, some recipe ideas uh, that we're going to talk about. Where you know, we'll tell people uh, where to find it in a little bit. But uh, I sent you a recipe of mine. I'm calling Labor Day Beer Stroganoff, uh, where I grilled some <clears throat> some stew meat on the grill just to get some color and flavor, uh, and then use that with uh, uh, in the instant pot with mushrooms, and uh, I specify Guinness, but again, the brown ale will be excellent for that with that beef. Uh, but the mushrooms and onions sautéed in uh, bacon, uh, you know, finishing that off with uh, some, uh, a little bit of half and half, and then serving that over um, uh, egg noodles. And mm. man, that's super uh, rich and delicious, um, and really a good, a good use of, uh, of your beer. Yeah, and also, again, it's that particular recipe was one of those things that once you, if you haven't had it in a long time, once you taste that, you realize how much you missed food like that, especially considering, you know, oh man, that beer, it just sounds like, especially brown ales, which, you know, have got a nice heavy malt base, just brings so much to beef. Um, that's, uh, again, one of those dishes that you'll make it and then realize I'm going to put this back in the, in the rotation. Yeah, I flash back. I was using, you know, we talked the other day about uh, roasting a whole chicken and then using, you know, you can use the leftovers of the roast chicken for all kinds of things. Yes. Uh, and I went searching for recipes online for, you know, leftover roasted chicken. And one of the recipes I found was um, a chicken teriyaki or, or ch ch tetrazzini. I'm sorry, chicken tetrazzini. And boy, I made that, and that really took me back to the seventies. That's <laughs> oh yeah, right. <laughs> Delicious and sinful, and uh, you know, rich. It's uh, like it's like tuna salad. I'm mean, a tuna casserole. No one makes tuna casserole anymore. But does it get much more simple than tuna casserole? Yeah, I think there are a lot of things. You know, we go through phases where it's not okay to eat pasta anymore, or it's not okay to eat this or eat that, or you know what, and and so. I think you know with moderation. Uh, obviously, right. you know if you're if you're drinking a lot of beer and you're cooking with a lot of beer, you know moderation is is the key. Uh, you know it's what we try to try to preach here, and we try to practice as well. But uh, <laughs> right, uh, there was a meme on the internet that said uh, after this uh, isolation, you know, and the quarantining, people are either going to come out as really good cooks or alcoholics, and that's not right. <laughs> And that's there's probably a lot of truth. There's a whole lot of drinking going on on the social medias, you know, people saying, oh, it's, you know, Zoom happy hour and things like that. Slow down, people. Everybody take it easy. Uh <laughs> I wanted to, I wanted to hit on this later as we talked, but I'll go ahead and hit on it now. I think it's really important that people think about this right now and, and think about it right now as you're listening to the show. Uh, our mental health is going to get affected here. And I think exactly as what, what you said is exactly what I wanted to say. I'm seeing it, too. People are day drinking. They're, they're, they're taking it too far. It's okay to enjoy yourself. But I think people are, are thinking, well, they're on vacation. And they're going to treat it like this. And it's going to affect us. And I think that um, in, I didn't talk about this much on my show. In fact, I, I haven't talked about it much at all publicly. But I went through a phase after Katrina's death. Um, where I realized I needed some therapy. So I went and I talked to a couple of therapists. And one of the things they told me was that people think that the, the beer is the answer for them or alcohol is the answer. If they're feeling down and they might have a drink, it might make them feel better. The actual opposite is true. It's like having anxiety and saying, I think I'll snort a line of Coke. It'll, it'll make me feel better. Yeah. It, does, it does the wrong thing to you. And if we go overboard and we do this too much, um, we're going to be we're going to be needing a different kind of help when this is all over. So, yeah, it is important. Um, keep your head about you. This is no different than any other time in our lives. This is not going to last forever. We're going to be out of the woods before you know it. And we'll be back to normal. 
Uh, we just don't want a whole new set of problems that we have to hold on to. Well, I'm sorry to bring the show down. James. No, well, just, sa- no, it's well said, and and I'm and I appreciate your sharing that, uh, you know, that personal uh, advice. And uh, we, uh, I guess we should say that Katrina was your lovely first wife, uh, and you yeah. lost her uh, a few years ago. And uh, you have done a, a great job of taking control of your life and becoming more healthy, and really, you know, uh, are, are a great example of someone who you know, could have gone down the chute, <laughs> you know, not saying yeah. anything about your personality specifically. But in that situation, uh, there is a lot of stress and there, you know, could be a chance that, you know, isolation could take you to a r- very bad place. So good good for you for, for taking control. Now, look, if you love yourself enough, you'll take care of yourself. You know, it's as simple as that. I, I don't think any of us would want to say that we don't love ourselves. So, you know, it's, it's all you have to do. Just... Look in the mirror and uh, ask yourself, are you happy with who you are? If the answer is yes, then keep going. But uh, if deep down the answer is not yes, then do the work. It's not that hard. It really isn't. Well, there you go. Yeah. Let's let's. uh, My God. Oh, such a downer. I was so happy (laughs) on my show. I come on your show. I bring the whole thing down. I'm so sorry, everybody. (laughs) <laughs> Phil's 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 having the feels. <laughs> yeah. What the hell, man? What happened to me? It's just me. I'm just little little Debbie Downer yeah. here. That's uh... <laughs> yeah. No, we're pulling out of it. We're pulling out of it. My Let's... life is a depressed social path. <laughs> Let's talk about 30 minute cassoulet. <laughs> yeah, now we're talking. Hey, listen. So let's not get too far off track here. In, in all of this, you talked about freshness, right? One of the things that people end up buying if they're going to cook real food at home, one of the things they end up buying and then not using a lot of, and it goes bad because it's fresh, are herbs. Mm. If you've got a little bit of space, even on your, your, uh, in your kitchen window, grow your own herb garden. It, it doesn't take a lot of, uh, of water. It doesn't take a lot of time. Just go to Home Depot or your nursery and just buy a few plants, some parsley, oregano, um, thyme, rosemary, sage, whatever you like to use. Uh, Plant it in a little planter, keep it watered, keep it where it can get some sun, and you'll have fresh herbs all year for the most part, and you'll be able to use what you need, and you'll always have it at your disposal. That is, I'll tell you, herbs, as you well know, is one of those things that can completely change the complexity of a dish, an herb or a spice. Yeah, Uh, Those are great items to have around, always. And there there are, are herbs like basil, uh, that will, you know, it, it, we we usually have like a basil shrub by the end of the summer because <laughs> yeah, it's right. just huge. It just gets out of control. It gets messy. Then you got a lot of pesto on your hands. Yeah, exactly. Which you can also freeze, uh, by the way. True. That's right. You can. Uh, but yeah. uh, my my stepmother got us uh, a couple of Christmases ago. Got us one of these Aero Garden things with the grow light and, and the timer and the pump, and you put the you know Miracle Grow stuff in the thing. And we've got a bunch of uh, lettuce. Uh, uh, in the uh, in the laundry room now in the, in nice. the little garden. So that's great. Yeah. You know, so yeah, there, there, there's some fun, uh, you know, fun little solutions that that I think that it's going to change the way that I cook and that I shop and that I think about food. Um, you know, because you get into these habits where it's wasteful. Really, for me, you know, I have to drive, you know, 10 or 15 minutes to get to, you know, the grocery store that I go to. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's wasteful. It's a waste of my time. It's a waste of uh, fuel. You know, it's a waste of uh, of energy to, to be, be doing that every other day. So right. if I can think like my mom used to back in the 70s and, you know, she'd just go to Safeway like once a week or once every, you know, week and a half or something like that. Um, right. But – with strategic planning, you know, I, I I feel like we can streamline our lives so that we come out of this, you know, even better. Yeah, I think it's going to change us for the good, because I think if you start doing things like meal planning, you plan out the things you want to make, and then you can go so far as what James is doing, which is, you know, outlining where those items are so you don't have to make multiple trips throughout the market. Um, you could pretty much set a, a path as to what you're going to make on what day, how long things are going to last in the refrigerator um, so you use those up quickly and then start you know, thinking about items or making things that you can freeze if there are leftovers because ultimately there are going to be leftovers. 
And uh, you can really stretch the dollar, too. I mean, you can save a lot more money this way because you're not constantly throwing food, making things that actually do freeze well. Yeah, yeah. You can, you know, it's like I say, it's grandma's way of thinking, this Depression era thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. You use every well, part well, of the chicken, you know, and like I said, yeah. you know, we can when you're making, you know, like we've both got instant pots, you know, when you're cooking a whole chicken, say, in your instant pot for your pho, you know, then you you probably are going to have some spare broth left over. Uh, so then you can freeze that and use that in different recipes later on. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's this whole rewiring your your brain, you know, taking stale bread. You know, you mentioned uh, in one of our conversations to making uh, bread and you can make bread with beer, by the way. Uh, but then you can take stale bread and, and turn it into to other things as well. Yeah. In fact, there's a recipe that I have for a tomato bread salad, which is a uh, it's it's a Spanish dish. And it's absolutely delicious. And you could use stale bread in this salad because the bread actually starts absorbing some of the vinaigrette that you make. And uh, it's completely – I made it for a vegan friend of mine who uh, absolutely loved it. So it's a healthy dish. Um, you know, if you're not worried about uh, eating some bread, it's, there's not a lot in it. But um, it's another one of those dishes where you can reuse something that's going bad on you. Of course, if you're brewing beer – you can't be worried too much about bread, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. I forgot the audience I'm talking to here. Again, it's it's all about moderation, you know. Yeah, God, God bless all you. <laughs> now it's uh, you know, let's think about beer and 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 make a list of like your your favorite beers to cook with and your favorite beers to pair with. I mean, it seems like to me that there are beers that are delicious to go with dishes that aren't necessarily the greatest to go in the dish. Yeah. And I think that's where you really, where it can really shine. If, even if you don't use beer in a dish, because there's some, there's some dishes and especially some of the recipes I share here that uh, don't call for beer at all because beer adds nothing to it. You don't have to put beer in everything, you know, but if it, if it calls for it, if it, if it's something that will enhance the dish, then certainly use it. I like pairing lighter fared dishes with lighter fared beers, darker dishes with darker beers. And the reason for that is I don't want, and there are going to be people out there that will disagree with this. I don't want the beer to compete with the dish. Mm. I want the beer to, you know, I want to eat. I want to drink along with what I'm eating. Like I would drink a red wine with a steak, right? But why? Because it just seems to match. You know, those flavors, the bold, um, even some tannic uh, heavy wines would go well with something deep and dark. Lighter things like fish, I would want to go to a white wine. Then I'd go to like a golden ale or a, um, a light uh, triple, things like that. Quadruples are some of my most favorite things to pair with dishes. Your beef stroganoff, I would certainly have a quadruple with that, mm. with that dish, you know. So... I always think about what I'm eating and in pairing it, what are the things that would elevate that dish? So I think that that's, you know, if you think along those lines, you look at the dish, you know what it tastes like, right? Start thinking about what beer that I like, you know, would go well with this. Um, for my money, IPA pairs with just about anything. Mm -hmm. And I know it's, I don't know what the, what the, cause I've been out of the loop for a while. I don't know if people are tired of IPAs, but um, I'll never get tired of that, especially if it's done right. Something that's got a nice, heavy malt base. And even with the, the IBUs are in the 90s, it still doesn't matter because the beer's got so much body that uh, there's a great marriage there. It, IPAs pair so well with so many things. Now, the great pairing uh, that, that often comes up with IPAs is carrot cake. Uh, and I think it would work well with tart beers as well because you've got carrot cake, which is this rich uh cake with this uh, sour this uh, sour cream icing uh that you know you eat it and it's just like oh it's very heavy and it weighs on your tongue and what you want after that is something to kind of be a cleanser and to scrape off that Wa wash wash your palate yeah so so a nice I wouldn't have thought of that but you know what you're you're absolutely right a super bitter IPA or a nice tart beer uh, you know, which, you know, some people by themselves, uh, you know, that would go, they don't like those beers. Like, for example, 
uh, a few years ago, Steve uh, Wilkes gave a, a beer pairing dinner, and he did uh, one of the courses was uh, grilled bratwurst. You know, and this is mm. you know heavy greasy uh, food, uh, and my wife Susan generally doesn't like sour beers, but we but he served La Folie from New Belgium with that, and she liked oh, yeah. it because you eat you know eat, eat some of that greasy heavy uh, meat, uh, and then you take a sip of that nice tart substantial beer that you know by its on its by itself she didn't like but paired with that food you know it just elevated yeah. everything to another level well la folie brings the funk man there's lactobacillus up the <laughs> in that beer <laughs> i'm gonna have to bring out the sound effects we <laughs> well i'm so sorry sorry it's okay it's and okay. phil phil is back <laughs> Just a peek into Phil's personality here. We're, we've lear we're learning a lot about you in this uh, episode, Phil. We're <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe too much. <laughs> oh well. Any 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 final thoughts? Uh, you know, as we as we talk about you know just you know isolating uh, with food and beer and you know how just your your philosophy, Phil. Wrap it all up. Well, this goes against the grain of everything that I've stood for as a as a cook, as a home cook, uh, is that, you know, we've got to buy canned foods sometimes because you're left with what's left. Right. And I think if you if you're going to hunker down and you need things to last, you're going to have to buy some things in cans. It's can canned foods are OK if that's what you have. One of the things I want to stress to everybody is not to buy canned vegetables. Because canned vegetables, it's that's just a crime against nature. It's not something, you know, I'd rather you throw a can of vegetables at my crotch than make me eat it. It's just horrible. Um, but, you know, canned beans are good. In fact, one of my recipes called for canned beans if you can't make them yourself. But um, Instapot, as James mentioned, if you don't own one, they're not that expensive now. It is one of those things, even if you're you call yourself a gourmet chef. It will expedite the process of some menial tasks in your kitchen so much. Mm. You'll wonder how you lived without it. Everybody uses pressure cookers. It's basically it has a pressure cooker function. You could use it for that if that's all you used it for. But, uh, James, some of the stuff that you do with this Instapot. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, you cook in it. I have yet to scratch the surface of this thing. Yeah, it's we use it like two or three times a week. Um, and in fact, this evening, you know, we're going to go from dried pinto beans in the bag uh, to uh, pinto beans with, uh, you know, some some ham in there and some onion and some jalapeno and such as that in like an hour and a half. You know, you don't have to think ahead to, to soak the beans. You can make, uh, you know, I make uh, split pea soup in like uh, less than an hour. Uh, yeah, wow. It's ridiculous. And yeah. again, from stable ingredients that you can... Uh, that you can either keep in the cupboard like onions, you know, they'll go bad, you know, after a while. But if you keep them in the dark, you keep them cool, they're, you know, they'll they'll keep for a while. Uh, yeah. But, you know, ham, you can freeze uh, the the beans or the peas, you know, are dry. Um, right. So, you know, it's it's a super easy recipe that I can, you know, if I've been slacking off and haven't thought about, you know, cooking all day and then it's like, oh, well, we can have some beans. So, yeah, no, exactly. No, beans are great, especially if you buy a whole pound of beans, soak them and then cook them in that pressure cooker. You'll have beans for a while and a lot more cost effective than buying them in the cans. Plus, they taste better. Yeah. And you don't yeah. even have to soak them. You can just wash them and stick them in that yeah, uh, just... in the pressure cooker. So. Right. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Well, Phil, you've you've put together a document uh, yes. And where can we find it with all with all these recipes, including the full recipe of my Labor Day uh, beer stroganoff? Where where can they find this document? Yes. Yeah, so uh, it's called a pandemic cookbook: How to Eat Your Way Through an Unmitigated Disaster. <laughs> and yeah, the title. I know I wasn't too sure. You should have heard the ones I threw out. <laughs> it's, that's a, that's a little grand, grander than I yeah. thought. <laughs> Yeah, no, the the one I threw out, cooking from is all. These are all based on these are ideas based on actual classic cookbooks. I had one called "Cooking from Cans: How I Lost the Joy of Cooking." <laughs> it's, 
There's another one I had. Forgive me, Julia Child, massacring the art of French cooking. <laughs> Yeah, and then this one was a little dark. The Cabin Fever Cookbook. 120 easy meals before you swallow a bottle of sleeping pills. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think the, we need to focus group these. Do, yeah, a, do a little went, Zoom focus group. Yeah, these. I went with this one. Yeah, I thought it was a little nicer. So you can pick it up free. And this is something I'm going to be working on this. So I'm going to add to it as we go. But uh, this is it's up now. You can check it out. You can download it. Go to mylifeasafoodie.com forward slash cookbook it's available in both pdf and epub format you could read it on your tablet your phone uh, i formatted it so you can print it and the way i've done it it's uh, set up if you have a horizontal view on your reader on your phone put it in horizontal view and there's uh, two two facing pages on the left you'll see a little intro with the ingredients on the right simple cooking instructions none of the stuff in here requires you to have a master's degree in culinary school or anything like that all simple stuff you can cook. Anybody can cook this stuff. I could teach a monkey to cook half these things. <laughs> I'll wait for that video. <laughs> yeah. I get to work on that. All right, Phil. This has been a, it's been a lot of fun. I hope it's not another yeah. uh, three years before we talk again. No, I know. I'm sorry if I went a little off track. I hope I was able to provide at least a little insight. Um <laughs> You take a boy. I tell you, you really roll the dice bringing me on this show. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. I give you credit. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Well, thanks again to Phil. Again, you can find the free downloadable cookbook, no strings attached, at mylifeasafoodie dot com slash cookbook. It's mylifeasafoodie dot com slash cookbook. And I'll tweet the link, and uh, I'll also put it into the description of this episode on basicbrewingradio.com. Check out cyclingoc.com for Phil's biking videos and put them on your exercise bike or treadmill while you're uh, stationary and exercising. Enjoy that beautiful California weather and scenery. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. That's all until next time. Till then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long, everybody. Mm-hmm.